Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's live event. My name is Cassandra Trezise, and I am delighted to be your host again from Inspiring Vacations. And today we have an absolute treat for you. Not only are we going to delve into Antarctica, get nice and up close and personal with one of the coldest, most remote places on our earth, but we are going to be taken on that adventure with no one other than Dominic Barrington, who incidentally is leading into his 15th year with Herdy Gruten, one of our very dear partners. And Dom, as he is fondly known, is actually an on, on tour expedition guide, uh, part of the team there, part of the expedition team, and an environmental scientist. Oh, I'm losing my words today. I do apologize. But you know, Dom actually started as a photographer on board the expedition cruises and you are absolutely in for a treat today. The imagery is spectacular, so inspiring and his knowledge absolutely incredible. So welcome to our event today, Dom. Thank you and thank you everyone for joining and hope this is a nice break for your life in lockdown and that you are, like me, equally excited about the prospect of returning to some of the more remote and pristine parts of the planet. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is such a great way to be able to, you know, delve into travel and really start exploring while we are in this crazy situation and, and we are all in our own homes at this time, but travel is just around the corner and we want to make sure that we're ready to go and we've decided on what the next uh, holidays for ourselves and yourselves is going to look like. Maybe making a little bit of a list, bit of a plan and look to be perfectly honest with you, Dom, my plan is bucket list moments for the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, and I'll take all options, but I'm excited to get to Antarctica today. Look, it's fabulous. I love this particular photo. Um, we uh, operate and work under um, a group called IATO, which is the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators. It's a big word. And when you come on board, you'll hear more about them. And they um, set the guidelines for how we operate and manage and protect the amazing environment we have in Antarctica. And one of the rules that we have is to don't get any closer than five metres to a penguin. And when you look at this photo, you go, that ain't five metres. The great thing is the penguins have not got the memo and haven't read the rule book. So that if you are quiet in Antarctica, these animals are very inquisitive and they will come up and talk to you. The person kneeling down is a, in the red jacket is one of my colleagues and friends, a Chilean um, ornithologist by the name of Dr. Manuel Marin. Um, and he uh, is a penguin researcher. So when he's not working with us, um, he's actually conducting uh, research on the penguins that are found in the southern regions of Chile and Argentina. And the, the black boots uh, beside him is one of our guests who is getting an update um, and uh, information from Manuel. And those boots are the boots that we actually provide you on board. So you don't actually have to fly to Antarctica, take up your precious luggage uh, limit with these big, heavy rubber boots. We provide them. They're incredibly warm. And I guess one thing I do say to people when they are on board is when it comes to the first landing, you're all living in fear that you are going to freeze to death. And I will guarantee now that every one of you will wear way too many clothes for the first landing. And it will take you about two or three landings to figure out how many layers you need to wear and what's right for you. But just go with the knowledge that for the first landing, you are going to wear too much and you are going to be too warm. I think we're prepared for that now. Nothing but experience to tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's have a look at the map. Let's do that. Where are we headed today? Here we go. So our voyages that we're talking about today will be departing from Ushuaia, otherwise known as Fin del Mundo, which is the end of the world. So it's the largest, uh, it's the largest and southernmost city in the world. And it's um, the jumping off place for the majority of voyages to Antarctica. 
So you normally arrive, well, you get up, woken up in uh, Buenos Aires that, oh my God, it's early for a flight to, a three hour flight to Ushuaia. There's normally a bus tour around Ushuaia as we get the ship ready uh, for your um, embarkation. And then later that evening, once we've done the, uh, got you all on board, you've, you've got your luggage here, nicely situated in your cabin. We've done the safety drill. We start sailing down the famous Beagle Channel and then roughly about two o'clock in the morning, we do a right turn into the famous and fearsome Drake Passage. Um, it's, people have a love-hate relationship with the Drake. Um, I always like it if people get at least half a day of a rough Drake, because then you've got a story to tell that you did actually survive <laughs> the Drake Passage. If you have what we call the Drake Lake, um, yes, it's very nice and it's very comfortable on board, but you don't get the bird life. Um, so one of the great things about crossing the Drake Passage is you get the birds, you get the albatross, you get the, um, the petrels and the prions all following and flying around the ship. They need the wind. And so if we have no waves, we have no wind, and we have no wind, we have no birds. So unfortunately, if you, want, if you are um, a serious birder, you want a rough drake because then we'll have um, lots and lots of amazing birds, the... Uh, black-browed albatrosses, the wandering albatrosses, the southern albatrosses. Sometimes we get light-mantled sooty albatrosses as we cross the Drake as well. Um, but it really is um, great. What I love about the Drake is a rite of passage. I think we all lead, in, lead incredibly busy lives, and I think we've realised with our life in lockdown that our lives don't have to be as busy. But the Drake Passage gives us an opportunity to stop and on the way down, get ready and prepared for the experience that Antarctica is going to give us. The impact that it's going to get ready for the impact that it's going to have on you. Um, you will come back a different person from visiting Antarctica. It is just a truly amazing place. And then on the way back, when we head north, it gives you a day and a half, two days to process what you've actually experienced and go, Oh my Lord, what did I just do to myself? And the landscape down there is truly magnificent. It is stunningly beautiful. The sunsets are amazing. Unfortunately, they are very early in the morning. So sometimes the sun, the sun might start setting at 11.30 and mightn't finish setting till 2 a.m. and then it starts rising again at 3, 3.30. So as I like to say, you're a long time dead, so you know it is worthwhile staying up for the sunsets. And we get the really good sunsets later in the season. Um, that's because we actually have more dark time towards the end of the season. So in the November, December time, it's probably a little bit early to be getting the really good sunsets. But later in the season, we do get spectacular sunsets like this. And this is an area south of the La Mer Channel um, where we get these beautiful um, sunsets and we get the beautiful ice in the water as well absolutely beautiful so when is the best season to travel to antarctica uh that's always the big challenge when to go it depends what you want to see um so early in the season you're going to see a lot of activity at the rookeries we're going to see a lot of activity of uh, the penguins coming back um, trying to find their mate um, you'll see the nest building um, and you'll see them doing it like they do on the Discovery Channel um, and it's boys <laughs> on top and that's the only way I can sex a penguin. Uh, and then, so that, so that's all happening in November um, and starting yes. into December. Then when we move into December, January, that's probably my favourite time down on the peninsula because at the rookeries we still have a lot of activity. Um, we have the eggs, so you'll have the opportunity to see the eggs. And the penguins normally lay uh, two eggs, normally a day or two apart, and then they hatch a day or two apart, and it takes about a day for a chick to hatch. Um, and then you'll see the feeding of the chicks. And depending on the age mix of that rookery, you'll probably see some courting uh, going on. You may see some mating happening um, towards the end of the season, um, it's usually the first or second season uh, birds that are mating later in the season because they haven't figured out that they actually have to start earlier. Um, <laughs> but it is. Um, and then towards um, 
December and into January, we tend to start seeing a greater preponderance of whales. We do get whales throughout the whole season, but it does seem to be that December, January, February period that we have the highest concentration of whales that we see. Yeah, fantastic. And certainly yeah. from the perspective of what departures we have available, we do tend to run the season, as you say, from November through to about March of the following year at the latest. So it's good to know that every time is a good time, just depending on what you personally are looking to, to get out of this incredible adventure. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I'm coming up for season 15 and I'm just as excited as I was for the first season. Um, it's just so good for the soul to go, go through. I work with some amazing people. This is um, one of our Dutch uh, biologists, Peter Nell. She's an amazing bundle of energy and knowledge. And here she is. So we've managed to pick up a brittle star um, in the water of Deception Island, which is an active volcano that we take you into. It's a flooded caldera. And so there she is. She's found this, uh, brit uh, this brittle star and she's using that to talk to some of the guests on board about um, the life cycle of the brittle star. So that's one of the advantages that we, we try and ensure that where possible we have um, credentialed scientists and really experienced guides who actually have the knowledge and have the passion and the ability to share and impart that knowledge with everyone who's interested. And as I said earlier, people who come to Antarctica on the whole are people who are interested in being there. Um, I've worked on some other vessels and I felt that the people on the other vessels wanted to say they had been to Antarctica rather than actually being in the moment and spending time in Antarctica. My best advice in Antarctica is don't try and see everything, don't try and do everything. Find a nice little rock, sit down and let Antarctica wash over you and try and listen to the deafening silence. Um, when you come to Antarctica, you've given yourself an amazing opportunity to go to a really special part of the planet. It's really important just to spend some time sitting down and reflecting on that. Spend some time watching the activity in a rookery and you'll start observing behaviours. And when you observe behaviours, you can anticipate those behaviours. And by anticipating behaviour, you can actually then start taking photos of animals doing things because you, you can see what the behaviour is and you go, okay, when they do that, that means this is about to happen and I want to get a photo of that. So that's one of my top photo tips is to stop and to watch and just let the continent wash over you. Amazing advice. Um, and viewers, of course, as always, uh, if you have any questions at all that you'd like Dom to answer for you um, at the end of the presentation, please do put a note in the comments and we will come back to you. Uh, it's not very often that you get such in-depth knowledge at our fingertips. So let's make the most of that and ask away, ask all those questions. One of the fun parts of my job is that I get to drive the boats and I'm actually driving that boat at the bottom of the screen. And we had a day, this is, and no, we can talk about this one. We had a day, I was driving uh, the boat um, in what's called uh, Anvord Bay. And we have very strict whale watching guidelines that so we're only allowed to have uh, three boats near a whale, no closer than 100 metres and no more than 30 minutes at a time. And the people on my boat were saying, quick, go to that whale, go to that whale, go to that whale. I'm like, no, no, I can't, there's too many boats there. And then we had those whales come and spy hop alongside the boat. And then we had a very inquisitive humpback whale come and actually swim around one of the boats. And this was, photo this was videoed from the ship. Um, this is how close they come. Uh, we've signed up to a new um, project where there's actually speed restrictions now in place. So we are actually reducing the speed that we uh, navigate between landing sites um, to help protect uh, the whales in the environment. And some of the whales are very inquisitive and will actually come up and swim alongside the boat and um, put on a display for everyone to get involved with. That is such a magical experience, but I can see there that that whale also didn't get the memo about the distance, but that's okay. And one of the great things about the whales and being on the small boats out with the whales is listening to them breathe. Um, it is such a gentle sound. Uh, it's a really wonderful experience to um, listen to um, the whales breathe. 
So here's the guy <laughs> saying, whoa, I can't believe that just happened. That's incredible. <laughs> Penguins. Penguins are endlessly, endlessly, endlessly entertaining. Their antics will just make you smile. The Gentoos in particular are stone ceiling thieves. Um, so they use the, the, the stones to build their nests to get them out of the snow. And the earlier they can get their nest out of the snow, the sooner they can lay an egg, they can hatch their egg, they can feed their chick and fledge their chick. The sooner they start that, the greater the chance they have of a chick surviving the season. Uh, but they, are, they use the stones to actually um, pair bond. So I don't know many women who don't like getting a diamond, uh, but they also <laughs> like to... Um, Penguins are the same, but they're not quite diamond. Uh, one of the, the most popular things to do in Antarctica is to go camping. And this is a wonderful experience some guests had at Danko Island on the Arara Channel. Just have a look at this. This was at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh, my goodness. Look at how many there are. That's incredible. <laughs> wow. So these how penguins many have seen these red, red tents and oh. gone, I want to see what they are. <laughs> There's a couple of thousand penguins um, that have come down from the rookery to check out what's going on. Um, I'm really sad to say that the two guides who were accompanying the people camping slept through all of this and were absolutely horrified when the guests showed them the video in the morning of the penguins coming and checking out the campsite. Oh, no, they would have been incredibly disappointed. <laughs> they were, but everyone was just so happy that... Um, all the guests were awake um, to see it. Um, it's truly, truly an amazing, amazing sight. So that island in the background is called Coverville and this island. Um, this was a really special day for me, uh, driving the boats, having an Adelie penguin decide to join my boat. Um, so we were out cruising and the Adelie just jumped in the boat and then proceeded to march up and down the middle of the boat like he was expecting the, uh, the troops. Everyone did the right thing. They got their cameras out and photographed the bejesus out of that poor little penguin. After about three minutes, he decided he'd had enough and he decided to jump up on the anchor box and back out over the bow. Um, <laughs> that particular day, it also happened to a colleague. So we actually had two in-boat penguin experiences um, that particular day. So these are the whale experiences and these penguin experiences like this are unusual. But the only way you are going to experience them is to by putting yourself in the situations where they may happen. So that means if it's a cold day, don't sit in your cabin, come out. Antarctica yeah. is about the ice. We love the ice. Um, this is one of our photographers, Chelsea, um, hamming it up for the camera um, with one of the pieces of uh, ice that we pick up and share around. That would have been rather heavy, I imagine. Yeah, um, and then this is what you see is the, the amazing colours that we get with the ice and how much ice is actually under the water. Um, so it's, and that's one of our typical blue sky days in Antarctica. So you'll come down to Antarctica thinking you're going to freeze to death and there may be days where you actually are walking around just in a long sleeve T-shirt um, because it's so warm and sunny that particular day. Now these penguins look like they're doing a spotty yoga or something there on the on the ice. <laughs> uh, no, they they you can um, you can see that they're all white, uh, so they actually come back from feeding. So they've been out feeding and they have uh, cleaned themselves and preened themselves, and are now walking back up to the rookery to start feeding their chicks. So they also looking quite fat and happy there. And uh, these are the gentoo um, penguins. Uh, we can tell them gentoos because they've got the red beak and the white eye patch. That sort of almost looks like a pair of swimming goggles on them. So how many species? You can see, uh, there's normally we see four up to seven species of uh, penguins. So we've oh, got wow. gentoos, adelies, chin straps, uh, macaroni. Sometimes we see rock hoppers and sometimes we see emperor penguins. So I've seen three emperor penguins um, in my time down there. We're usually on the wrong side of the peninsula to see emperor penguins, but we do keep an eye out. Um, here we have a stunning sunset at the southern end of the famous Le Maire Channel. 
And again, when we have nights like these, we do recommend that people come out. Kayaking. To me, this is the most intimate experience you can have in Antarctica. Um, you don't need any prior kayaking experience. We provide all the equipment. There are three prerequisites. Uh, the first is that you're able to speak and understand English. Uh, the second is that you can swim. And the third is that you can fit into the equipment we provide. So they're the three prerequisites, but it's an incredibly intimate experience. We take you out, we take you away from the ship. So you get to experience um, Antarctica quietly. So you'll hear penguin, the plaintive call for a penguin. You'll hear the blow of a whale. You may be lucky enough to hear a seal sing to you, um, but they, they take you out exploring the ice and exploring the environment. You're down at the water level. It's incredibly intimate and really, really powerful. And this is one of the few activities that you are able to pre-book um, to make sure you get an opportunity to do it. Our captains love sailing through the ice. To them, it's like a big game of dodgem cars. These are all Norwe very experienced Norwegian captains and they love the ice. That's a big slalom race to them. Uh, this is a very rare dolphin. It's a southern right whale dolphin. And this was, I photographed this um, as we were sailing down the Beagle Channel. I was in an office working and I looked out the window and saw this dolphin and took a couple of photos of it through the glass of the ship, which I knew was a mistake. And so I've grabbed my camera and as I've run, run past reception, I've yelled out, dolphins, make an announcement. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, got outside and managed to capture some photos like this of this um, quite rare dolphin to see, but it's absolutely stunning. And a lot of people were able to come out, uh, see it live and photograph it as well. Gosh, so, when we, when, so when we have things that are worth seeing and photograph, we make announcements. So this is a black-browed albatross in flight on the Drake Passage. One of the great things is we have a photographer on board and you have you have the ability to access that photographer at any time with any questions that you have. They normally give a presentation on photography at the start of the voyage so you know how to get uh, shots like these. So here we have a um, uh, glaucous gull with a um, chick net, um, hiding and staying warm under its wing. Uh, to me, ladies, don't you wish you could put your mascara on as elegantly? This is a close-up of um, the, the eye of a black-browed albatross, probably one of the most elegant birds that there are flying on the seas today. And if um, you're fortunate to have an itinerary which goes to the Falkland Islands, you have the opportunity to see those. And you also get the opportunity to see um, gentoo penguins on grass. And at one location, they're on grass, and it's actually a sheep farm. So you have Gentoo penguins and sheep in the background, which is slightly disturbing. Um, it's a, a tour that runs from um, Stanley in the Falkland Islands to a place called Bluff Cove. Um, it is a working sheep farm. There is a competition amongst all the places that um, host visitors um, in the Falkland Islands about who can put on the best afternoon tea. Um, and uh, this, the one at Bluff Cove is very good. But the one at Carcass Island, it's run by this delightful English lady who prides herself on running, uh, providing afternoon treats for, afternoon tea treats from around the Commonwealth. So you walk into this room and there's this table. It's like going to Hogwarts. This table is filled with afternoon tea treats from around the Commonwealth. So there's lamingtons, Nenish tarts, all sorts of various goodies. And no matter how hard you try, you cannot empty the table. <laughs> uh, it just keeps refilling and refilling and refilling. Um, so it is um, a pretty amazing uh, spot. And um, it's nice to actually go somewhere where you get a decent mug of tea. Uh, so this is a photo that I took um, of an iceberg um, on the sea. Um, as you can see, we've got a lot of penguins up there. I was giving a presentation to a group of um small kids in Denver, Colorado, and I was asked, how did the penguins get up there? And I said, well, if you're a penguin being chased by a leopard seal, that gives you a lot of incentive to get out of the water. And uh, 
they were sort of so why do penguins like eating why do leopard seals like eating penguins it's like well do you like popcorn penguins <laughs> are leopard seal popcorn then the headmaster headmistress of that particular school offered me a job because they said oh, you kept that group of kids quiet for 45 minutes seals <laughs> um crab eater seals absolutely beautiful animals misnamed um people when they did the first autopsies opened the stomachs and all this red stuff came out so they thought it was crabs was in fact krill and if you're lucky to see these guys hold out on land you might if you're quiet you might actually get them sing to you and i've had it happen a couple of times and it's a really magical sound but they're just fabulous animals to see in the water as well so we see uh, three main species of seals we see the uh, crab eaters the waddells and the leopards crab eaters and waddells are very social animals so they'll haul out on the ice together the leopard seals are fairly solitary and we'll usually only see a leopard seal hauled out by itself This is a really, really historic and special place. And when you come on an expedition cruise, you've got to come with flexibility in mind because we are not in control of the weather, the wind and the waves. So we have a very open and a very flexible itinerary. We know the places we want to take you and we'll have a plan A, we'll have a plan B. Being a Norwegian ship, it means we use the Norwegian alphabet and there's an extra couple of letters in the Norwegian alphabet. So we actually get to have a few more plans up our sleeve. This particular place is Elephant Island, and this is where Shackleton left um, the 41 men for three months while he sailed off to uh, South Georgia and walked over South Georgia. So this is a shot from the beach looking across um, to where um, we had parked the boat. Adeli penguins, uh, probably my favorite species of penguins, incredibly um, expressive uh, birds and they are very very entertaining when we see them walking up and down the beach they march up and down the beach in a in a big mass and then they they run down to the water's edge and then run back run down run back and then finally they'll decide as a group to enter the water because it's safer to enter the water as a group because then the seal can only take one out of the 20 but if you go in one by one the leopard seal can take 20 of you but if you go in a group there's more chance of survival so very very entertaining animals um, to see and watch as they march up and down. Uh, beautiful sunsets again. This was leaving Paradise Harbour. Um, when you come down to Antarctica, you'll all have, bring a camera, I hope, to capture memories that mean something to you. Um, there is the CSIRO Australia New Zealand Nature Photographer of the Year Awards. Antarctica is included in the region, so you can enter the competition. And this one won the 2012 um, Landscape Photographer of the Year Awards um, through Anzang. So, Everyone has the opportunity to take amazing photos in Antarctica. Um, we're actually now running uh, programs to help you get the best images out of your iPhones. Whales, we love the whales. And one of the uh, projects we're involved in is a citizen science project called Happy Whale, where we encourage you to photograph um, whales and whale tails and um, upload them to the Happy Whale website. And then if you are the first person to have photographed that whale, you get to name it. Um, there is a fee in the naming it, but you do. But what you're doing is contributing to that whale um, and to the knowledge we have of whale migration and their locations. And if someone else photographs your whale a year or two years later, you're sent an email with an update of where your whale has been spotted. Um, I've actually identified a new whale um, from a voyage up in Iceland, and um, I've had a couple of updates about where it's been spotted since. Um, so. That leads us into like the citizen science part of um, what we do on board. It's one of the activities we offer, um, which is really exciting. Um, it's a way of helping to encourage you to get more engaged in the environment and more engaged in protect protecting and preserving Antarctica. Yeah, absolutely. Um, your photos are just stunning there have been so many comments uh, about your photography it's just incredible and before we move on to the activities because i know photography adventure is one of the activities offered with hurdy gruton but i've had a few people ask on the comments here already what type of camera is best to take i know you also mentioned teaching with your yeah. phone look uh, the thing 
the best camera to take it the best camera to have is the one that you're going to take with you um, and you can get amazing images with the phones nowadays um, we've got one photographer working for us now a la american lady called shane uh, mcguire um, and she teaches people a few tips and tricks with their phones and it's amazing i'm stunned by what they're doing um, for me i take um i used to take the big slrs and the big lenses um, now that my role has changed, um, I have what's called a bridge camera. I have a Sony bridge camera with a 24 to 600 millimeter lens. It's light, it's easy to carry, um, and it takes amazing images. Um, but the great thing about Antarctica is if you can't take a good image in Antarctica, throw whatever you're using away because you don't know where to look or when to point or when to click. So. <laughs> Um, it, sometimes you, your sort of brain goes into overload because everything is just so amazing. It's like, where do I start? And the worst thing I see for people do um, is certainly at the start, um, I got into trouble for saying this, but I'll say it again anyway, um, <laughs> New York lawyers are the worst uh, <laughs> because they will come down so pumped, so hyper that when they get off the tender boat and come ashore, the camera comes up to the eye and they spend their 90 minutes ashore looking through a viewfinder. And then they'll yeah. come back on board with 5,000 photos. They won't have stopped. And when are they gonna have the chance to look through those 5,000 photos? I think it's much better to come back with 10, 20 kick-ass shots that you have nailed because you have spent the time being in the moment and letting the continent wash over you and not having it removed through the lens of a camera. Um, so Absolutely. again, back to that, find a rock, sit down, let the continent wash over you. Yeah, absolutely. Because I've, I've often said this before, but travel lasts a lifetime and it's about the memories and the experiences that stay with you. And you quite often when you're talking to somebody and I can hear it in your voice already now, it's the excitement, the pure love, the pure passion of something you've seen and experienced that just shares on to the next person, the next person, and it keeps keeps in your memory as well. I think that's so special. But moving on, uh, with Herdy Gruten, there's a lot of different activities of course that you can take um, advantage of while you're on an expedition cruise I know you mentioned kayaking before which I think would be just stunning as something we can pre-book for you before you go but there are also a few other opportunities for um, passengers or guests when they're there yep and the thing to realize is you don't actually have to do an extra activity every landing is included for everyone um, so it's not like oh i've got you've got me down here but now i have to pay to go ashore no every landing is included for everyone now if you want to try and do three things in a day that's pretty hard so you might have to give up one if you want to do something else and something else um, so the extra activities are kayaking most intimate experience you can have in antarctica um, it's really 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 hard to tip our kayaks snowshoeing um, we actually use um, norwegian army snowshoes these are really lightweight really easy to use um, very comfortable and we um, when you go snowshoeing we'd like to take you to places that you wouldn't normally get to go to on the landing sites um, uh, which is great. Um, we've got our photography programs where you get to have a lot more one-on-one -on -one time uh, with the photographers. Um, so we run uh, an extended um, photographic cruise where we have less people in the boat and we go out specifically with a photographer in the boat to help you capture the best angles and the best experiences um, that we do there. Um, citizen science is a key one that we're doing now and this is um, available to everyone. So we're running programs on um, plankton sampling. So we're looking at the impact of um, the melting glaciers on the distribution and density of the plankton in the water, which is the basis of the food chain. Um, so we take you out and we do sampling at that. And we've got happy whale. We're also doing a um, cloud survey where we're working with NASA and trying to take uh, time taking pictures of the sky 
when a satellite's overflying. So we're actually providing the ground truth for what the satellite is seeing. Um, and these are things that you can then do at home. And in that particular app for the cloud survey, if you want to, you can do a mosquito survey. <laughs> um, can't say I've done that one yet. Um, no. And then that leads into um, uh, something new that we have is our science centres. So we just back up a slide. <laughs> uh, we have really, really um, amazing um, microscopes on board and the microscopes are hooked up to um, TV screens so that we can actually talk and interact with you about the plankton that we've sampled that morning or that day and we have under the microscope. We have geological thin sections so we can talk about um, the geology and these are, uh, equipment is available for you to use. And uh, we're also um, having scientists come on board and we're supporting scientific researchers on board. And what's fascinating with that is they will actually talk about their research and how they're doing, you know, the methodology of their research. So you get a deeper understanding of how these scientists work. Uh, but uh, last season we had um, a couple of Italian researchers who were monitoring and checking um, the species count that we were seeing. So they were used, they were spending all day, every day on the bridge counting what seals they saw, what whales they saw, what birds of prey. So they're looking at the level and the intensity of the, uh, the predators on each voyage and they would then give a presentation about that research. One of them gave the most stunning presentation on cetacean or whale and dolphin communication and sounds. Um, so oh, wow. we can't guarantee that every voyage, but what we're finding now is that scientists are actually contacting us wanting to come on board and use us as a platform to further develop and uh, improve their research ability. So we're really excited about that. And it's a great thing, again, because it helps us generate a pool of global citizens who are committed to preserving the polar regions. I think that's a real win-win for everybody, isn't it? Uh, not only for, of course, the scientists and the work that they're doing, but imagine being a guest on the expedition, being able to learn firsthand. And as you say, being able to be advocates for um, the environment and certainly Antarctica. And that comes from knowledge, I think, and being able to really understand what they're looking at and understand what the scientists are actually doing there. And it does come also partly from... Um, where we stand as an organisation and, and as a company in that we were the first uh, cruise organisation. I, I don't like to call us a cruise ship because we're not. We don't have dancing girls. We don't have casinos. Um, but we do have really strong emphasis on education and learning. And that's the sort of people who want to come to Antarctica, is people who want to experience and learn uh, to get rid of single-use plastic. So we got rid of plastic straws. We're working with our supply chain and with the supply chain, it is a long, hard process. Uh, we actually have um, an expedition jacket that we give you um, and the supplier started sending them to us, each jacket in its own plastic bag uh, with much um, uh, discussion from us. Uh, they have now put 16 of the jackets in one bag in one box, so that's a win. Uh, one of our main suppliers in Norway is now touting the fact that we drove them to change. And it was our leading supplier of plastic cups, plastic plates, plastic knives and forks. We drove them to become um, more environmentally conscious and do away with the plastic. So they're now the leading supplier and their business has just exploded in um, plastic alternative um, disposable cutlery and uh, crockery and they're, they're saying we love what we've done um yeah our port, our port agent in ushuaia contacted us with an idea to improve the recycling um capabilities that they have so they were said this is going to cost you more and it was without a doubt a no-brainer for us to say yep we're doing it um, so we do a pre-sort um, on board and the guests can get involved in that or the rubbish bin so we have like a plastic a paper and a food waste and all that gets pre-sorted and we resort that all again before we offload um, the garbage in a Ushuaia and the port agent then has uh, set up a site in Ushuaia where it then takes our garbage does a refined sort into the plastics the glass the metal and and then it actually ships it in containers back up to Buenos Aires where it's properly recycled and produced into new products, which is great. So it means that our waste is not going into a landfill in Ushuaia in a, quite a pristine and um, 
precious environment itself, it's actually been recycled properly. And I mean, I'm proud to work for an organisation that is committed to doing things like that and to be looking at, we got rid of um, single use plastic water bottles on board. So we've actually installed yeah. um, filtered water stations where you can get still and sparkling water. We provide you with a metal refillable water bottle as part of your welcome on board kit that happens on the expedition uh, cruises i'm not sure uh, what happens on the coast of norway whether it's on the coastal voyages yet or not so that's an area i'm not expert on is the coast i'm sort of spend my life exploring yeah. other parts of the planet but certainly on the expedition cruises uh, you're normally provided with a refillable water bottle that you can then um, take away with you and you know continue your commitment to protecting the environment Absolutely. Incredible steps. And it, it's one voice and then another voice and then another voice. And it just changes that flow on effect. And, um, and it helps us to change the environment. I think it's incredible, the sustainability work from Hurdy Gruton. Um, one of the other activities is camping. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Everyone loves camping. Um, it's a fabulous thing. Unfortunately, we only have the ability to take 30 people camping at a time. And it is probably the most popular extra activity. Uh, so what happens is normally on when we're heading southbound on the Drake, we take you um, and give you a presentation on all the activities. And once everyone's done that, everyone gets an opportunity to sign up. And it's not a first in best dressed um, situation. Um, normally for the camping, we have a very public um, lottery and we pull out um, the um we pull out the names of the winners of the camping and i haven't met anyone who has been disappointed with camping yet um, they all absolutely love uh, the camping experience because you never know what's going to happen what we try and do is we set the camp up and then the ship sails away yeah. so it gives you that true explorer feeling of oh crap where's the ship gone and so you get to spend yeah. the night without hearing the noise of the ship as well. That would be magical in itself. That's yeah. for certain. That's one for certain. Great, yeah. um, no, 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 please go things, on. One of the great things for me, why I keep coming back is I love the environment. I love working with the guests, but I get to work with some incredibly amazing people on board and all of them are incredibly generous at sharing their knowledge. It's like, oh my God, my brain is so full. I've got to get this stuff out. Um, so we can have a look at, you know, it's a mix of people with like me who are old and young, uh, but what binds us together as a team is our shared passion for the environment that we're working in and our passion to share that knowledge. So um, we've sort of, most of us are, do have that explorer look, so we're going for that Amundsen look. Um, <laughs> and we're a global bunch, um, Icelanders, uh, Poles, Norwegians, um, Australians, Chinese, all expert in our various areas. So you can see that we're a, an interesting and eclectic bunch of bodies, uh, but we cover the range. There's normally uh, ornithologists, biologists, geologists, um, glaciologists and historians on board and the historians tend to be absolutely fantastic storytellers. That's incredible. So any question that you could uh, ever think of uh, when you're exploring Antarctica, I'm sure there'll be somebody on board that can answer those questions for you by the sounds of things. If they can't answer it straight away, we'll get there as soon as we can. Um, Certainly one of the things I like is when we work up in the Arctic and we work in Greenland, we always like to have an experienced Greenlander in the team. But we also like to have a trainee who is normally a young person who's doing a tourism um, course or degree and wanting experience. So we actually have the experienced Greenlander and then we also bring along people who are willing to learn. And it's amazing what we learn from the experienced hands and the younger people on board. But let's have a talk about some of our ships because that's, you know, we all need a nice um, base camp and the, the company has just uh, launched two new ships. We have uh, Roald Amundsen and Friedhof Nansen. Um, for those of you who know anything about polar history, these are classic, classic polar names. Obviously, Mr. Amundsen beat uh, Scott to the South Pole 
Um, and that was his mission was to get to the South Pole. And then Friedolf Nansen uh, accompanied him. Friedolf Nansen has a connection with Herdegren, and he was one of the original um, Herdegren captains. And he established the what's called the sportsman's route, uh, which was the route from uh, Tromsø in Norway up to Svalbard. And after he'd established that route, he then went and joined Nance uh, Amundsen sailing to the South Pole. So, um, you know, exploration and expedition is part of the DNA of um, Hurtigruten, and we're proud to actually name two of our ships after these. These ships are amazing in that they are the first hybrid expedition ships. So they are a combination of uh, diesel electric. So we have huge battery banks on board. And so that like your um, hybrid car, uh, when the engines are running, they are adding either using, uh, adding power to the batteries or taking battery power out. So we improve our efficiency by over 30%. Um, it's truly amazing. The ships are really quiet. There have been times where I've actually gone to bridge to check to make sure that we're not just running on battery power because it's been so quiet. Um, as you can see, these are beautiful ships, um, beautiful outdoor areas. The ships are amazing in that the cabins are really comfortable. Um, they've got enough space for you, but you don't come on these voyages to spend time in your cabin. You spend time on these voyages to be outside. Um, the pool and jacuzzi area is fantastic, um, giving you the opportunity. Um, you know, nothing like sitting in a nice warm jacuzzi as you're sailing through the Arctic waters. Antarctic waters, sorry, and the Arctic waters. Um, this is a little schematic. It shows the... Um, the lecture hall where we give our presentations. So we don't have dancing girls, but we have people like myself and my colleagues who will dying to impart their knowledge with really interesting presentations. Um, the screens are eight foot high and there's TV screens around, so everyone gets to see everything. And then you get to see those two round tables um, in the middle at the top. They are the science center where all the microscopes are set up and then a bit of our library and everything. So the science center, absolutely fantastic leading class, cutting edge um, binocular microscopes that you're allowed to use hooked up to the TV so you can have amazing conversations with the with the team about what we're seeing, what plankton we've caught um, and the like. So it is a really great space. Um, and this is also where some of the science are. Obviously we need to get you off the ship. So we tender, we uh, take you in our tenders. Um, so here you can see one of the boats really really comfortable um, boats that we use and the nice thing is uh, when it's time to go ashore or to go cruising you're called down to a special room called the expedition launch where we check to make sure all your equipment is in place you then walk out onto this rigid platform at sea level there's usually two colleagues there to help you onto um, the tender boat and the tender boat actually has a rigid floor so you're actually going from a rigid platform into a boat with a rigid floor and then you sit down um, on the side of the boat and are either taken directly ashore or taken for a cruise up to 90 minutes in duration. Um, lots of fun being out on the water. I think any time you get to experience Antarctica from the water level is a fantastic um, experience. I think that's incredible. And some questions that we've had coming in while you've been talking, it's been running hot, Dom, I'll be honest with you. Everybody is loving it. Uh, but a couple of questions that come in. And the first one that came up was actually how many people are normally on an expedition cruise with Hurdy Gruden? Um, on, uh, Nansen and Amundsen have 530 berths, but we never take 530 people. That's way too many. Um, under the IATA rules, if you take more than 500 people, you're not allowed to land. So you might see some of the Holland America, um, uh, some of the Holland America ships will go down there, but they have 2,000, 3,000 people. So all they can do is a sail by. And I'm like, why would you get so close and not take the advantage um, to come ashore? So uh, uh, we have, uh, 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 it's called a class two ship, so we can take up to 500 people. Um, we don't take that many. Um, most of the time, uh, last season, we had a couple of uh, voyages where the 500 person ship only took 180 people. Um, right. So, uh, but normally it's somewhere between 350 and 420. I mean, as a rough guide. And the mix um, tends to be uh, probably 30% German, 30% uh, 
US and Anglo, and then rest of the world. So it's a really nice eclectic mix of people. But the thing that brings everyone together is their shared passion about exploring Antarctica. So you can uh, develop some really strong and amazing friendships. The cabins are comfortable, but the public spaces on board are generous. So you never feel cramped and crowded. And the ships are very open. So there's lots of places where you can actually see right through the ship. And so the ship's always got lots of natural light um, yes, on board, which is really nice. Yeah. Let's have a look at some other questions here. We had, oh, we had somebody ask if Inspiring Vacations will in fact have the Greenland expeditions with Hurdy Gruton for 2021. Good news. We will have. And in fact, between you and I, we have a very exciting expo coming up very soon and we'll be launching a lot of these additional expeditions. So right now we have Antarctica, which is thrilling and very exciting and we have space available for you uh, but we will be branching out into all of the incredible expeditions from Hurdy Gruton so that that's great news that's just been confirmed for us let's have a look and see what other questions we have we've got lots of comments about how incredible your photography is Dom and how excited people are to get there absolutely agree with that uh, let's have a look up here. Hi, Pam. And Beryl has just been on recently. <laughs> and she says, I was 80 and I had a ball. The lectures are splendid. So that's oh, beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> the oldest person I've had on board was a 98-year-old gentleman who brought his blushing bride of 94 with him. Oh. They were a stunning couple. Absolutely amazing. They did every single landing bar two. Um, Isn't and they're great. And you know, it's also what's nice is um, if you're a single traveler, feel comfortable coming on board. You are not ostracized by being a single traveler. Um, you will have an amazing time again because people are coming here not to show off, they're here to explore and experience. And when you, sh uh, when you want to explore and experience, you want to share that and um, you want to talk about that. And I think you'll find that. Um, even as a solo traveler, the voyages are great. And at the end of the day, you can always come and talk to one of us. We wear these lovely um, <laughs> plaid shirts um, or we wear red T-shirts. So he see our colour scheme. It doesn't clash at all. Um, and, yeah, we'll sing it. Um, awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um Kylie asked us about um, feeling unwell when you're traveling. Um, what what ah. we can prepare for seasickness? <laughs> ah, the dreaded Drake Lake and the Drake Shake. <laughs> um, I, 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 for me personally, I can throw up in a teacup. <laughs> so for, what I do is I have found a seasick medication that works for me. Um, it's called Mechazine Hydrochloride. Uh, we do actually have it on board and you can actually uh, buy it tablet by tablet. I would recommend on the day of departure taking one um, and then the next day because you've spent a bucket load of money uh, coming to Antarctica. Why spoil the experience by feeling awful the first few days? Um, and I do find it interesting that we do, if we've had a very rough crossing across the Drake, we only have to make an announcement once that we're ready for a group of people to come ashore and then um, everyone is there. Everyone wants to get off the bloody ship. <laughs> um, once we're down on the peninsula itself, we're sailing in fairly sheltered waters and it's very right. calm and um, so, Mainly on the way down, you may have a day and a half. It's unusual. Um, we get, we've gotten very good at reading the weather patterns, and one of the apps that we use is windy.com. Mm. So you can have a look at that website, um, and we use that, and we the captains are very good at picking the speed and where we head um, to give us the best and the smoothest ride. The other nice thing that we have is these things called stabilizers. And these are two big wings that come out from the side of the ship and they help take out some of the roll from side to side and a little bit of the pitching backwards and forwards. And that helps uh, smooth the ride down. 
But me personally, I like it if people get about a half a day um, of the rough because then you get to see what it's really like. Also, when we're down on the peninsula, I think it's nice if you get a couple of um, crappy days because um, if you, all you get is a blue sky experience of Antarctica, you're not getting the true experience and not the experience that the, the, the polar um, explorers had. Um, the early explorers, they hated it when it got above zero because then it mm. meant everything dripped and, and was wet inside the tents. So um, They liked it nice and cold. They liked it nice and cold. Um, <laughs> I'm that just trying the... to, my, yeah, my craziest experience crossing the Drake is um, a 12 metre sea. Um, we only had that for a couple of hours. And that was fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, where, that is. Um, where, you know, we were smashing through the waves and I was talking to the captain on the bridge and all of a sudden there's this cascade of water across the bridge windows and we both looked at the able-bodied seaman who was supposed to warn us when a big <laughs> wave was coming and hadn't. <laughs> it's like, oi! Uh, um, yeah, so There's it can be entertaining. Experience, another experience to chalk it up to anyway, isn't it? Well, once you've had a rough Drake, you can then go to the shop and buy the T-shirt, I survived the Drake Passage. There you go. And that, at the end of the day, is a great goal to have. So... <laughs> But as you say, you know, it is about the experience. It is about stopping and enjoying Antarctica for everything that it is, be it the blue skies, the grey skies, be it the rough passage, be it the calm peninsula, be it all the beautiful scenery and the animals uh, that you get to, you know, interact with from a distance, of course, from a distance. That is what travel is all about. It's creating those memories. Dom, I cannot thank you enough for coming and sharing all of your knowledge, photos and experiences of Antarctica. This has been a tremendous event. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you again soon. hope so. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys on board because I think there's a really nice fit between Australians and Norwegians. Um, it's a really nice cultural fit. We get on really well. The expedition teams love having more Vegemite eaters on board. And um, I, I, I've worked for some other companies and I started working, working with Hurdigroot and I went, yep, found my tribe. Happy here. We just we click. It works really well. There's a really nice cultural fit. You'll feel really comfortable. It's not pretentious. You don't need to bring a suit to wear to dinner. Um, it is very comfortable, casual. Um, it's a very relaxed. Um, you'll be able to talk to the captain anytime you see him. Please address him as captain. You know, yeah. they are relaxed, but there are still some protocols that we adhere to. But it is a very flat um, structure that we have on board so that if I have an issue, I can go and talk to the captain straight away. I don't have to go through a myriad of silos, I can say, oi, I'm not happy about this, or I think this is a problem, or, you know, so it works really, really well. Um, we were sailing down in Antarctica in January with the start of um, COVID. And before you knew it, we had upped our sanitation game whilst we were on the voyage. We had no issues with health on board. Um, but all of a sudden we actually had staff members at the entrance to the restaurant ensuring that everyone was sanitising their hands before they were going in. Um, the hotel manager let the, the people on board, uh, the, the staff on board, know that they had upped um, the onboard sanitation um, of all the high-touch services. So there's handrails on the ship, and we always encourage people to have one hand for the ship. Um, they were being sanitised at least three times a day, and the ship was being fogged. Um, during the evening hours. So it was really good. And the, the great thing about that was throughout all of this, no Hurdigrin ship has had a case of COVID on board. So yeah. Um, okay. yeah, that's a great thing. And the whole boarding, when I signed off, the boarding procedure had changed and there was a health check um, at the airport before you even got to the dock, before you got on board, uh, people were being checked by the medical team. Um, so... I think you can uh, come on board and rest assured that we will do our utmost to make sure you have the best experience um, going to one of the most amazing parts of the planet.
But thank you very much for spending some of your life in lockdown with me this afternoon. It's been fantastic yeah. fun. Hey, what, where else would we rather be? Nowhere else but exploring Antarctica with you. Thank you, Dom, and we will see you down on the peninsula soon. Fantastic. Look forward to it. Welcome on Thank board. you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>